Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. A fundamental principle of the scripture is to care about others, to want to be a godly influence in the life of other people. And when we receive the love of God, that love of God that we receive by faith is going to manifest itself with love for others. And for the most part, we see that those who walk with God, who have a good reputation as a follower of the God of Israel, these individuals, they cared about others, especially that next generation. In the scriptures, especially prophetically, that next generation, we are called to prepare for the kingdom. And even those who are not people of faith, we hear many times people say, well, I hope my children, I'm working hard so that my children have it better than me. And the hope is my grandchildren have it better than my children. Many people hope for that, work for that. But here in the passage of Scripture that we're going to be studying from the book of Isaiah, we're dealing with one of the kings of Judah. And not just any king, but a man by the name of Hezekiah. For example, in the Talmud, Hezekiah is a candidate for Messiah. Many people believe in rabbinical Judaism that Hezekiah, he is a prototype for the Messiah. You can learn a lot about the work of Messiah, the character of Messiah from King Hezekiah. Now, even though he was faithful for much of his life, I would not hold him up as an example of the Messiah's character, how Messiah would think. Why? Well, what we're going to read in the last part of this chapter, the 39th chapter of Isaiah, for me, it's shocking because Hezekiah did walk faithfully for most of his life. The scripture says that he was a good king that walked in the footsteps of his father. It is speaking about King David, even though he was several generations after David. But he walked in that type of obedience. God used him greatly. But towards the end of his life, he did not finish well. Now, we should be individuals that are sensitive to the time that God has given to us. And we should, as we grow older, we should mature in the faith. We should understand spiritual things better. And we should desire to grow more faithful, more obedient, be a greater vessel for good, the purposes of God in our life. Do not make the mistake of so many who as they grow older, they become easily shaped, easily moved away. They want to compromise the integrity of Scripture. Instead of growing more committed, they become more liberal in their thinking. This is not pleasing to God. We want to be individuals that walk in that straight direction in the will of God, in an upright manner, all for the purpose of serving him and bringing glory to his name. Hezekiah, a faithful king, a good king, up until what we're going to see in this passage of Scripture. 
So please take out your Bible and look with me to Isaiah and chapter 39. Now, we have seen that Hezekiah, when threatened by an enemy, he trusted God. And God proved himself to be a deliverer. God restored Hezekiah's kingdom. We find that the Assyrians did not capture Jerusalem. But God, as a response from prayer, moved those armies away. Hezekiah did many other things that testified of his faithfulness, of his belief in the God of Israel. And God used him. We saw two weeks ago that Hezekiah, he became very sick. And that sickness would be to a point of death. And Hezekiah, and we focused upon this last week, when he heard about this terminal disease, when Isaiah the prophet said, pray and get your life, your household in order. He didn't do that. He lamented before God. He wept, wept bitterly before the Lord God. And God healed him and gave him 15 more years. Now, we also learn that that number 15 is related to the name of God. In other words, these 15 years, and it's significant, 15 years, he was supposed to walk with God, demonstrate the character of God. But did he do this? Well, let's look at what the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 39, beginning in verse 1. It begins by saying, at that time. What time? Immediately after King Hezekiah was healed, that he received that good news that God had heard his prayer, that God was going to heal him and give him these 15 additional years. He had received that word. His health was restored. And because of that, notice what happens. It says, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, the king of Babylon. Now, we hear Babylon, and we think about the Babylonian captivity. We think about Babylon being this strong empire. But at this time, it was not so strong. People were not intimidated about Babylon. Things are going to change. And there's going to be a prophetic word from Isaiah that, that speaks to this. But Babylon at that time was not that threatening empire that it would become in the next generations. So this man, Merodach Baladan, the king of Babylon, he did something. He had heard about this miracle, the restoration of King Hezekiah. And therefore, he sent uh, letters and also a gift to Hezekiah. And notice what it says. For he had heard that he was sick, that is Hezekiah, and that he had become strong. Not just healed, but that word is to become strong, that he overcame this disease, this fatal disease. And therefore, the king of Babylon, he was interested in this. This captured his attention. He wrote letters. That is, he had individuals carry these letters all the way from Babylon to Jerusalem. And also he sent a gift. Look now to verse 2. What was Hezekiah's response to this? Verse 2. Hezekiah rejoiced 
over these things. He was glad that this news had reached Babylon about how God had heard his prayer, how God had given him 15 years, how he who was sick was now strong. So Hezekiah, he was glad concerning these things. Now, in the middle of verse 2, we are led to conclude, and there's no other way to understand it, that this king of Babylon also, with others with him, he brought many individuals that traveled from Babylon with him to Jerusalem in order to visit King Hezekiah and to hear what took place. How is this possible? What brought about this miraculous healing? Who gave you 15 more years of life? But notice the response once more. Hezekiah, he was glad, rejoiced over these things. And what did he do? It says in the middle of verse 2, and he showed them his house. And the next word implies to a, a storehouse, a type of treasury, a type of warehouse where he stored his things, his possessions. Now, we're going to see that two words are used here, and most of the scholars believe that these two words for treasuries speak about a personal one and also a kingdom treasury. And what did Hezekiah do? Pay close attention. Verse 2 says, He showed them, the treasury of his house and his silver and his gold, the, the fragrances, these spices, and the good oil, that is the good anointing oil, and all the vessels, all his vessels of the house, and all which is found in, and this is the second word, in his treasuries. And again, most see this second word for treasuries referring to the government storehouses, the wealth of the nations. And it says here, and there was not anything which Hezekiah did not show in his house and in all of his government. Now, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, would this be wise? And why didn't he say anything about the Lord God? This God who had delivered him from the armies of Assyria? This God who had healed him? This God who had given him 15 years and the significance of that number 15? He says none of this. But what does he do? He, he receives the king of Babylon and those who are with him, and he shows to them his wealth, both his personal wealth and the wealth of the kingdom of Judah. Those, those tribes that reside with him, all the wealth of this kingdom that he rules over. Now, again, there's no mention of the Lord God, nothing in regard to the miracle that God did for him, both in this healing and also militarily, when God moved away the troops, the armies of Assyria, so that Jerusalem, who was under siege, would not be destroyed. Nothing of this whatsoever. Now look to verse 3. In verse 3, Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, he comes to speak. Now, from the context, Isaiah knows what has happened. He knows what Hezekiah has done and that he has not spoken in the name of the Lord, had not testified 
to the fact that it was God who healed him. Look at verse 3. And Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah. And he said to him, What have they said, these men? What have they said? And from where have they come unto you? And Hezekiah said, from a far land. They came unto me from Babylon. So now we see that Hezekiah is speaking. He's saying that they came, and the emphasis before he makes mention of the place, he says from a far, from a distant land. Now, again, many scholars see this as a, a statement of pride. They came all the way to see me. They came all the way from Babylon. But here's the problem. They came to hear a testimony. They came to see why Hezekiah was healed. And how did it come about? Who healed him? How did he find the strength once again? after being stricken with a disease that was fatal. He didn't say anything of that. He only showed them his wealth and the wealth of his nation. Verse 4. And he said, What did they see in your house? Again, who's speaking? Isaiah the prophet. He said, what did they see in your house? And Hezekiah said, all which is in my house, they have seen. And again, there was nothing that was not shown to them that I did not show to them in my treasuries. And here, once more, the scholars feel that he speaks and uses the word that earlier referred to the government treasuries. And he says, my treasuries, that he felt that it was all his. Now, showing one's wealth is a, a symbol of pride. This miracle that he received, God answering his prayer, did not produce humility, but rather pride. It did not bring Hezekiah to a greater appreciation to God, but rather it caused Hezekiah to think about how great he is, what he has achieved, what he has accumulated. And all of this is really now his he has put himself in the place of the people. And this is a dangerous thought. When those who are entrusted to lead others, those who are responsible for others, who have positions of authority, when, when they believe that all of that power, all of the resources that they have authority over, that it belongs to them and they can use it for themselves. Such an activity is highly dangerous. It brings about disaster. Disaster spiritually and disaster in every other type of expression. So what did Hezekiah say? There was nothing that I didn't show them in my house, and in all my treasuries. Look now at verse 5. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Now, that expression, the Lord of hosts, it is a prophetic expression. It almost always comes in the context of God revealing something to someone else that takes power, something that is 
intimidating. Something that is a, a message that it's the mighty God, the sovereign God, and him alone that is able to carry it out. Now, if we're in need, it's good that the prophet would speak about the Lord of hosts. But if we are operating in pride, if we're focused upon the material, if we're thinking of self, if we're not understanding our call, Therefore, in those situations, when God reveals himself as a Lord of hosts, it usually speaks about a coming judgment. And thus is the case in the end of our study tonight. Look again at verse 6. He says, Isaiah says to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Now, I would, would circle that word here. It's a word that most of you know, that Hebrew word Shema. And I've pointed out that there are three major words for hearing in the Hebrew Bible. The word Lakshif, which means hear this. You need to pay attention to this. And then there's word Lehazin, which is a word that has a purpose, and that purpose is to draw someone closer. It's usually within the context of intimacy. Someone wants to say something that that, that proclamation has a purpose to bring about unity, to bring about closeness. And then there's the word Shema, Lishmoa. And this word, you need to hear it, but it goes beyond the concept of lakshiv, just to hear. Because the word lishmoa also demands, and I want to emphasize that, it demands a response. What Hezekiah was being told by the prophet Isaiah, he should have responded to in a specific way. And that way would have been repentant, tshuva to repent, repent for his actions, his wrong way of thinking, verse 6. Hezekiah continues, excuse me, Isaiah continues and says, Isaiah says, Behold, the days are coming when Babylon will lift up all which is in your house, which your forefathers have acquired until this day. They're going to lift it up, and the implication is it's going to be taken to Babylon. They're going to carry it away to Babylon. And notice the end of verse 6. Lo yivater devar amar Hashem. There will not remain anything, says the Lord. Now, this has a special significance. Remember we see twice in the opening verses of this, this chapter that, that Hezekiah says, there was nothing that I didn't show them. I showed them everything that I possessed, everything that the nation possessed. I showed them all my treasuries. And therefore, because of that, there is going to be, and hear this, there is going to be a total loss. Nothing's going to be left in Judah that's not carried off. And that which is left is going to be destroyed. So there's going to be a total loss that's coming. Now, one of the things that's very important in this, this passage, look again at verse 6, where it says, Hine yamim ba'im. What does that mean? Behold, the days are coming. It is a future reality. This is prophecy. It speaks about something that's going to happen in, in the future. And notice what else Isaiah says it gets even worse because now it's going to hit not only the entire nation, but 
he's going to speak about his family, Hezekiah's family, he says. And from your sons, which has gone forth, they have gone forth from you, and which will go forth. So it's not just a judgment upon the next generation, his children, but also for those who will go forth in the future. And we know that this this Babylonian punishment is going to be for 70 years. And many will never make it back. Many are going to die in exile before those 70 years are ended. And many who are alive aren't going to desire to return to the land. There is going to be such a loss of of the, the call of God upon the children of Israel. They're not going to be committed. Why? Well, the vi- the sons, the sins of the fathers are visited upon their children. What does that mean? That same sinful tendency that Hezekiah demonstrated is also going to be a sinful tendency that the generations in the future are going to have as well not being committed to the purposes of God, the call of God. So look again at verse 7. He says, And from your sons, which has gone out, they have gone out from you, and which will be born. It says, They shall take, and these sons and grandchildren and forth, so forth, They will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, that word I translated palace is the Hebrew word heichal. And it has many different usages in modern Hebrew. But but by and large, it's a spiritual word in the scripture. So it just may not mean palace but it can mean the sanctuary of of, of Babylon, meaning that that his children and grandchildren and perhaps great-grandchildren are all going to be idol worshipers. They're going to play a role in the Babylonian government. It says they will be taken and they shall be eunuchs in the sanctuary of the king of Babylon. Now, this is bad news. This is a devastating prophecy. Think about it. We're hearing that Hezekiah, this man that was sensitive for most of his life to the will of God, the instructions of God, the revelation of God, who walked in obedience, who had faith, who turned to Isaiah and listened to his prophecy and responded and implemented it implemented it into his life. Now he hears because of his sin, because of his pride, because of his forgetting that it was God that healed him. God who heard his voice. God who gave in these 15 years, and remember, 15, when we write it, traditionally, it speaks about the Lord God, that he should have used those 15 years for the Lord, but he didn't. He was selfish, thinking of himself. He did not finish well. And now he hears about this devastating news. This prophetic proclamation about exile for his sons and his grandsons and his great-grandsons and that all is going to be lost. Now, you would think that Hezekiah would snap back. He would hear that and say, Oh, Lord, have I sinned. Forgive me for my pride. I humble myself in your presence. 
And in the same way that he prayed bitterly with his face to the wall, that God would heal him, that God would extend to him forgiveness, that God would be gracious. And in the same way that he removed that disease, that he would remove this horrible, this horrible prophetic punishment. But what did Hezekiah do? Now, for me, this is one of the most surprising verses in the Bible. Remember, Hezekiah had done great things. He had trusted God. And what does he say here? Let's look now at our last verse, verse 8. And Hezekiah said to Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Good is this thing of the Lord which you have spoken. Good? How can he say, good is this thing that you were spoken? Here's why he thinks it's okay. This is why he's not bothered by it. Because he says, for the Lord, excuse me, for there will be peace and truth in my days. Meaning this, this isn't going to take place under my watch. Now, he's the cause of it. He's the guilty one. But during his days, that punishment, that that outcome of this prophetic, devastating proclamation is not going to happen in Hezekiah's life. It's going to happen after he dies. It's going to affect his children and grandchildren. And what does he pretty much say? If it doesn't impact me, it's okay. It's good. I'm glad that the punishment isn't going to be visited upon me, but upon my children, upon my grandchildren. This is not a good response. Are you thinking too much about your life? What you're receiving? What you're experiencing? This is not why God has saved you. God has saved you if you've received the gospel. You should be very sensitive, very concerned about that next generation and the generation after that, that you would be an influence on your children and your children's children for the will of God, the purposes of God, the plans of God, the calling of God, that you would have a spiritual impact upon them so that they would be more mature spiritually, that they would stand upon your shoulders, that they would be of greater faith, they would be matured and obedient, accomplishing more than you did. That's how a man of God, that's how the woman of God thinks and behaves. A very sobering message, this 39th chapter of Isaiah. And what I take away from it personally is this. If a man, a, a giant spiritually like Hezekiah, can finish so poorly, can, can be so selfish, that, that his success and God doing such things under his administration and in his life and under his leadership, if that, if that brought about such pride in this man's life, we should all be very concerned. We should strive and pray about humility and finishing well, being people who continually grow in our walk with the Lord that he would be pleased and that we would be a righteous influence upon others. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. 
These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank <laughs> you.